Welcome once again. Right now we're at Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 27. The law versus promise. Paul writes, Brothers, speaking of human terms, though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been confirmed, no one makes it void or adds to it. Paul's making a point here. When he's talking about a man's covenant, no one can add to it. Nobody can make it void. This is in regards to a man's covenant. How much more God's covenant? Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his offspring. He doesn't say to descendants as of many, but as of one to your offspring. That is found again, as Paul always quotes, the books of Moses here, Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, chapter 13, verse 15, chapter 24, verse 7, which is Christ, Messiah. Now I say this, a covenant confirmed beforehand by God in Christ, the law, which came 430 years after, does not annul so as to make the promise of no effect. Two points here. Number one, Paul makes it very clear that the covenant that we're talking about here in the book of Genesis, in the so-called Old Testament, is a covenant of God in Christ. In Christ, that is. And number two, Paul brings us a very important fact here, and that is one covenant cannot annul a previous covenant. In other words, one covenant cannot annul another covenant previously established. Very, very important, as a lot of Christians believe that the new covenant annuls the old covenant which was previously established. Verse 18, For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no more of promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by promise. God promised Abraham that his offspring would be a blessing to the world. That is based upon a promise. No conditions. Abraham didn't have to do anything to meet any condition to fulfill that promise. Verse 19, then why is there the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. It was ordained through angels by the hand of a mediator. Very interesting little note there that Paul adds to his letter, that the law came through angels. Where did Paul get that? He didn't say that God told him. He didn't say that the Lord told him. He didn't say that God showed him a vision. He didn't say, thus saith the Lord. He didn't say any of that. To find the answer, we must look at the context, the culture in which this was written. Do understand in those days, there was one text that was considered to be scripture. We find it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that is the book of Jubilees. It is the text that has this fact in it. It clearly, clearly spells out to us that the law came through angels. Considering the context, it is the book of Jubilees that Paul got this from. Now a mediator is not between one, but God is one. Is the law against the promises of God? Certainly not. Very important point here that the law is compatible with the promises. For if there had been a law given which could make alive, most certainly righteousness would have been of the law. But the scripture imprisoned all things under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ, that is Yeshua, Hamashiach, might be given to those who believe. Don't forget that the doctrine of the just shall live by faith is an Old Testament doctrine. How ironic is it when someone teaches the just shall live by faith that nobody stands up and objects saying, that's Old Testament. Verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, confined for the faith which should afterward be revealed, so that the law has become our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So let's get this straight. The law is the tutor or the teacher that brings us to Christ. In other words, the law teaches us to be like Christ. You see, Jesus obeyed the law completely, utterly, 
absolutely without breaking one of the commandments. Therefore, the more you obey the law, the more you become like Christ. So the law teaches us to be like Christ. Verse 26, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. This is not talking about all the whole world. This is talking about those who have faith in Christ Jesus. It means a whole lot more than just having a mental ascension. Yeah, I know Jesus existed. He died on the cross and yada, yada, yada. Faith in Christ Jesus means that you throw your life completely at his mercy. You are completely believing in him. You completely throw everything at his feet. You throw yourself down and you give your life to Jesus. You don't live for yourself anymore. You don't live for your selfishness anymore. You don't live for your lusts anymore. You are completely dead to self and alive to him, living to Jesus. That is believing in Christ Jesus. So the children of God are those who are truly in Christ Jesus, which I may tell you are very few. Verse 27, Paul wraps it up here in a summary. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That is the bottom line. For as many of you who were baptized into Christ. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the doctrine of baptism, baptism speaks of death. In the book of Colossians, Paul really makes it clear what it means to be baptized into Christ. But this passage, in context, remember, we just came from Galatians chapter 2, which ended by saying that I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. That means dead to self, dead to your sinful lusts, dead to your agenda, dead to sin. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Let me ask you a question. How can you sin if you are dead and Christ is living through you in all of his glory and in all of his righteousness, holiness, and sinlessness? And that is the bottom line. Seek him while he may be found. And if you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.